ready to go. Um, first on our agenda is Senate File 3176 from Senator Wickland. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, seven, uh, Senate File uh, 3176, it's a bill that was brought to me by um, DHS um, from the direct care and treatment area. And um, I do have uh, an amendment that I'd like to move before I get started, if I could. Senator Bigum. A4 amendment? A2. Um, A2. A2 amendment. I mean the A2 amendment. Senator Bigham moves the A2 amendment. This is an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. Senator Bigham to the bill and the amendment language we just adopted. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, this is a DHS direct care and treatment uh, policy bill. And ha it has uh, four sections. Three of them have to do with uh, different reporting. Uh, requirements and then section two has to do with setting up a, a new tr a transfer process uh, for people that are committed in um, secure facilities and I do have three people um, I, th I believe who are on the zoom um, who can talk about the bill um, Carrie Briones um, Dr. Hirachan, and I apologize for if getting her name wrong, if I did, and then uh, Megan Larison. Larison. Um, and so if one of them could state who um, wishes to, to kind of go if, through the uh, sections. If one of the folks from the department would like to uh, highlight yourself and uh, indicate if you want to help speak to the bill, Chair and members, my name is Terry Brionis and I'm the Legislative Director for Direct Care and Treatment. And I can run through, I'll run through the, I guess, three least substantive parts of the bill and then I'll have Dr. Harachin go through the most substantive part if that's okay with you. Yes, Ms. Brionis, uh, if you'd introduce, uh, put your name on the record and then thank you for walking through the bill. Again, for the record, my name is Terry Brionis and I'm the Legislative Director for Direct Care and Treatment. I'm going to speak to section one of the bill, which uh, relates to clinic, quarterly clinic, clinical reports that uh, we provide. Um, it touches on several facets of the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center, the Minnesota Security Hospital, and our community behavioral health hospitals. It talks about seven uh, different data points on the facilities. This report was mandated in 2016 and was requested by an external stakeholder. Um, we have found out that... Um, folks really weren't reading this and that the external stakeholder was uh, willing to ask us to for this to be put on a uh, annual reporting cycle rather than quarterly and that they can still obtain the information from us if they didn't not if they needed it in, in advance of that annual uh, cycle um, and that's that piece and if the committee wants I can certainly provide afterwards the seven data points I, I, I just didn't want to go through all of them for time's sake but I'm more than happy to if, if anybody wants them um, does anybody have questions on that one first? I'm not seeing any questions okay. at the moment, so please continue. Okay. Then I'll speak on section three of the bill, and this is a report on census and fiscal projections that we provide every November and February with a budget forecast. And the projections are on the Minnesota Sex Offender Program and state-operated state services. And what happens is we're not having much data change and the difference in the data that's provided between November and February. So we were looking to provide that just once in February and MMB had agreed to that. And then I can go on to the last section of the bill. Um, that is just removing some obsolete language that's been sitting in statute and there's three items. They all refer to services and programs that are no longer provided by direct care and treatment. Uh, the first item is relates to enter establishing enterprise activities. This language was passed in 1999. It was used once related to adolescence, uh, adolescent services, making that an enterprise activity that uh, did not remain an enterprise activity very long and we have not used that statute since and we would like to have it removed and if we needed to come back at any point in the future, we would ask the legislature for that authority to do that. The next items refer to the Minnesota 
Minnesota Extended Treatment Options and MSHS Cambridge. Both of these programs were um, were stopped or, or closed down due to the, the Jensen settlement and litiga litigation. And then the last item is a reference to regional treatment catchment areas. And this um, language was put in place to establish more geographical uh, spots around the state um, to get folks lined up for services. And since we aren't necessarily operating on a, a regional treatment, um, I guess model where folks can go to, to any part of the state to get the treatment that they need is most appropriate. We felt it was appropriate to remove that language. And those are those sections of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Briones. Um, do you also have the language of the A2 amendment in front of you? Could you, it seems uh, a little technical, but wondering if you could, if you have that, if you're able to speak to that as well. I can pull it up. I know that the change is really to that, um, at least on the portion that I spoke about. Uh, Senate Council had found that one of the, on the census and fiscal projection language, that the way we had it worded, it was going to remove the requirement for us to provide that report. Our intent initially was just to have it go to an annual format and that sunset like the rest of other reports that are required by DHS. Um, and since we in discussing this with Senate Council and also an amendment um, in a different committee on this. It made sense for us just to adopt it to have it just phase out right away. Um, the other amendment is on section two of the bill and I can um, that um, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Hrachan to explain it, but that really is just cleanup language and clarification. We had some language in there that was making references to a judicial appeal panel uh, we are, mon are modeling the language off a different statute and we removed it because it wasn't appropriate for our process. All right, I missed the name of who you are referencing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass over section two to explain that section of the bill to Dr. Sonia Harachin. Dr. Harachin, if you're with us, uh, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record and then feel free to begin. Thank you. This is Dr. Sonia Hirachin. I'm the medical director at Forensic Services in St. Peter, which is part of direct care and treatment within the uh, Department of Human Services. So as Carrie Brionos just mentioned, we do have a bill here, proposal, which is to allow patients who are committed as mentally ill and dangerous to be returned back to the secure perimeter. So the, this is the portion of the bill which is affecting patients who are currently residing in the non-secure part of our treatment program. They've already received permission through the special review board to reside there, but because of reasons such as psychiatric decompensation or just some life, um, life stressors, they could be experiencing some kind of decompensation whereby which they can not be managed in the non-secure program. So what we are proposing is that for our clinicians and myself as the medical director to have the authority to move these patients back to the secure perimeter where they would be housed for up to 60 days, during which time again, our clinicians would be working very diligently in order to bring them back to psychiatric stability, and then they could safely return back to the non-secure program where they were residing prior to that return, to that voluntary return. If they can't be managed, if they can't be stabilized within 60 days, their, their transfer would be revoked, and they would then again have to go through the special review board process. So the reason why we wanted to make this amendment is because we do have a process um, for our provisionally discharged patients where they can actually come back to us in St. Peter for up to 60 days. So this process is actually mirroring and that is a close parallel to that already, that well-established process, which is um, approved by statute. So we would like that to be established for us as well so that we could safely manage our patients within the secure perimeter. If any questions arise, please let me know. All right, thank you, doctor. Uh, anyone else uh, in the audience or online wishing to speak to this bill? And if not, we will go to committee questions. 
All right, hearing none, uh, Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and a question for the doctor. Um, uh, you just said that this would allow the medical director and physicians that are involved to make a decision to transfer someone back to a secure facility. But the, the bill here uh, says a committed person may voluntarily return to a secure facility. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around that. Um, are you, well, first let me clarify which is it. Um, would a committed person have on their own authority the right to return to a secured facility, even if the medical director and treating physicians disagreed with that? It's a really good question. I'm sorry. Um, yes, really good question. So this is really for the patients to have the empowerment to be able to transfer back to the secure perimeter on a voluntary basis. The medical director and the clinicians would merely be signing off on that process because we do, we can't, I mean, we do have a process established where the medical director and the clinicians would have to formally sign, sign off on that process, but it is a voluntary, uh, it is strictly voluntary for the patients to be able to switch back to this secure perimeter if they would wish to. Senator Latz. So Mr. Chairman and, and Doctor, you premised your statement by saying if they were decompensating or having difficulty in the unsecure facility. But at some point when there's decompensation, they lose the insight, the patient may lose the insight, especially if they're cheeking their meds or tonguing their meds or they may lose the insight to even recognize they, they have an issue, let alone you know, whether it's a mental illness um, or otherwise. How can they make an intelligent, voluntary decision under those circumstances to go back to the secure facility? Dr. Harachi. Thank you. So again, really good question. We would be working very closely with the patient. So one of the beauties, if you may, about us working with our patients is that we work with them for a really long time. So these patients have been with us for, say, a number of years, and we would know when their psychiatric status changes, and we would know when they get back to their baseline. So some of these patients also have an advanced directive. Some of them actually have something in writing which says that, you know, if I decompensate, this is what I would like to happen. If they have that, of course, we would follow it. If they don't, we would be working with them. We would also be working if they have a guardian or a substitute decision maker or a fam interested family who would be willing to make that decision on their behalf. Ultimately, if there isn't anyone to make that decision, as the medical director, I could make that decision for them. So. Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the proposal here would give you the authority to make the decision for them without having to go back through the special review board is really the point here, right? Doctor. No, actually that is the last case scenario. So we would be asking the patients. The patients would have the ultimate authority whether or not they would want to come back. If they voluntarily ask the treatment team to come back to the secure perimeter, of course, we would be willing to do that. If they're not, and they are psychiatrically decompensating, if they are engaging in, in, a, in behaviors that are actually deemed to be not stable and deemed to be not safe in the non-secure environment, then the medical director would have the authority to revoke them back to the secure perimeter, which is already an established process. So that is not what we're seeking. What we're seeking for is the patient to voluntarily be able to come back because right now we don't have that process established. Right now, the only way for a patient to come back to the secure perimeter is through revocation, which again, once they're revoked, there is this at least a six month process to get them out into the non-secure side. So I hope that that was uh, clear. Senator Latz. I'm, I'm going to try to understand this, um, and this is probably more of a DHS issue than it is civil law. I'm not quite sure why we're, we're doing this here, but I mean, I spent about a year at the Attorney General's office.
doing Jarvis hearings representing state hospitals, so I'm a little bit familiar, and doing MIND uh, appellate work um, on behalf of the state. So I'm a little bit familiar with this. Um, so there's already a, a process in place not affected by this bill that gives a medical director the authority to revoke someone's uh, permission to move from a secured facility to an unsecured facility because they think they need to go back to a secured facility. And if they choose to do that, then apparently there's a, like a six month process um, before that transfer can occur. So you could revoke it today and it might be six months before they go back to the secured facility. Is that what you're saying? Doctor. Yes, that is correct. Okay, and Mr. Senator Chairman, Lance. so the point of this provision then is to find, have a workaround from that rather cumbersome and lengthy process so that if, at least if, you couldn't do this against the patient's will, but if the patient was willing to do it, they could move that transfer very quickly rather than going through the six month long process to make that happen. And the patient might then find it to be in their own best interest to go back to the secure facility for a while until they are comfortable enough again to be moved to an unsecure facility. Is that sort of the idea here? Dr. Harachin. Yes, because frequently patients don't, most of our patients don't take six months to get stabilized, right? They're, they could take up to you know four to five weeks, maybe at the max, if there is indeed a psychiatric decompensation that can be managed with the medications. So this process really would help the patients get back to the level that they were at without having to go through the cumbersome SRP process. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, Senator Lass. sorry if I'm taking all the committee time here trying to understand this, but um, so you may have a situation where a person is stable, the director thinks they'll do fine in an unsecured facility. For some reason, they decompensate, and it's not really good for them to be in the unsecured facility in a decompensated state. But rather than going through a six-month process to send them back to a secured facility, uh, this would give them a, a way to get back more quickly, perhaps get stabilized again more quickly, and then be able to return to the unsecured facility once they're stabilized. Is, is that the idea here? Dr. Harachin. Yes, that, that is correct. Okay. Uh, Senator Latz. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess that makes sense to me to, just because I kind of like the idea of having a little more discretion in the hands of the, the medical staff at the facility. Mm -hmm. um, and I know when you're talking about mental health issues, Time can be of the essence. You don't want someone to wallow for three or four months in a decompensated condition, just getting worse and worse and worse, um, and being more of a risk to the public if they are, if they're MIND and they're in an unsecured facility that's not good for the public's uh, interests either. Um, there's a reason why there's a special review board process. Uh, part of that, I think, was not only to protect the public, but because historically anywhere there was, anyway, there was a, a, shall we say, a lack of confidence in some of the decision-making at the facilities themselves about what's in the patient's best interests. And I'm going back, you know, a long ways now when I say historically, but um, there is that history, and that's probably where the SRB process um, got, became implemented. Uh, so I'm fine with a little more, um, informality, if you will, or a little looser structure here to, to make this happen. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in some follow-up at some point. I would assume there's some regular communication with the DHS committee or with the DHS facility so that someone outside of this process is maintaining some oversight or getting some feedback um, on this. So it's not just a wholesale transfer of, uh, of authority um, and I, I do have my doubts as to whether a patient alone can make this decision. Just because once they're decompensated, they do lose insight. You know, sometimes they don't even re recognize that they have a mental illness. In fact, that's one of the features of decompensation is that they no longer recognize it. Um, but other people around them can see it pretty obviously because there are pretty flagrant signs of, of psychosis. 
Uh, so I guess I'm okay with, with, with this proposal here now that I understand its intention and how it would work better. Um, but uh, I, I, maybe someone can indicate if there's some follow-up that's intended in terms of process so there's some oversight or at least a report back of some sort to see how, how this worked. And Senator Latz, the bill's getting referred to the uh, Human Services Reform Committee from here, or I think, Senator Wickland, many of these questions are very pertinent <coughs> discussions to have there. But uh, any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Bigham. If there's no further discussion, then I'd be prepared to make a motion. All right. Uh, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I would move that Senate file 3176 as amended be recommended to pass and referred to HSR. On that motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Thank you very much. All right, we'll welcome Senator Coran to the table next to present Senate file 3665. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate 3665 is a bill looking at, um, at really about voter registration data. And so what this bill does and, and the reason for bringing it forth is um, it's really about the data classification of statewide voter registration system. At first, it looked pretty simple to go across the, the board and just change a word. But really what it has evolved into an approach that was much more comprehensive and to make it clear what the legislative intent is. Um, and, and so what the bill does, as we've seen over the past decade, multiple lawsuits have been filed uh, due to the lack of transparency and compliance with the Minnesota Data Practices Act. One of the fastest growing requests, actually across all state government, not just the important um, uh, topic of, of elections, but I'm the chair of the Legislative Audit Commission and the number one request they have is agencies failing to follow Data Practices Act and providing data requests. Also in the uh, uh, administrative law judge, as you were very well aware, one of their fastest growing topics is and, and or needs are to address um, government's failure to provide data, which is statutorily um, defined as public data. This one's specifically targeted at, at one of the key issues in elections. And many times the courts continually reference statute, lack of clarity, and intent. For this reason, the topic of our most important foundational rights as a legal Minnesota, legal Minnesota citizen is our elections, and it's why I brought this bill forward. What it does is it updates statutes to clearly identify public versus private data and legislative intent. These efforts will provide clarity to the Secretary of State and our courts if further lawsuits or, or requests um, move forward. And by doing so, we can ensure all Minnesotans have the faith in the election process by providing transparency and, account and accountability um, throughout all state government. And with that, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, what it does is it, it really goes through and it classifies the data on our statewide voter registration system, the public data for individuals, uh, some, exception, some exceptions for general classifications, um, follows, follows uh, data that is private, make sure that private for birth dates, driver's license numbers, and those types of uh, things that truly are private. Under the current law, the voter party preference as it relates to the presidential primary, of course, that still remains the same and that's only available to major political parties. And then we also preserve um, all the elements of the, of the uh, Safe at Home, the program which prevents vulnerable individuals um, to make sure they have their continued privacy. And with that, Mr. Chair, that's a presentation on the bill and I'll stand for questions. Anyone wishing to, anyone wishing to speak for or against the bill? Seeing none, uh, questions from the committee. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Cran, if I'm, if I'm reading this language right and, and understanding this, um, when you register to vote, that would be public. Senator Cran. Yes. And then- Senator Bigham. Mr. Chair, Senator Cran, in Minnesota, we allow 17-year-olds to register if they are going to be eligible to vote at the election at age of 18. So would the minor's information between the time they registered t 
to November when they would vote, pre presumably, or I, I suppose if they were going to, um, if they were going to be 18 by a primary. Um, so you get what I, where I'm going, Senator Coran. Would that information then be um, public from when they registered, uh, even if they're a minor? Senator Coran. Mr. Chair, under the, uh, under the current, we had this clarification last time as well, is, uh, and Senator Begum, is if they voted, I believe only the public portion would be available, right? Or they, they, the uh, no personal information besides the name and address and those things that are defined in the statute. Senator Brigham. Mr. Chair, I think we need clarification on that. And I don't know if somebody from the Secretary of State's office is here or online, but I think your information is public when you register to vote. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, minors' information would be public with if this bill goes forward. So I, if we, that or if, we, if council could uh, confirm that, I don't know if we have somebody here, but. I don't know if we have anyone uh, in the room and I'm not because following online. Uh, council, do you have any insight in this question? I know it's probably more a state government question, but do you have anything to share with us? Mr. Chair and members, so the bill language um, makes all data in the statewide voter registration system public data, except for the specific data that's identified in, uh, at lines 1.117 through um, 2.7. Um, so it creates like a general presumption of public data, and then you'd have to read through the rest of that language to identify when one of those pieces is private. And so, um, you know, a voter's date of birth would be private information. Um, so you would have to follow that analysis under this bill. I, 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 I don't know Chair. if that answers the question. I do see someone from the Secretary of State's yeah. office. If you'd come forward, identify yourself for the record, and then, uh, Give us your answer to the question. Welcome. Hi, um, Nicole Freeman, Office of Secretary of State. Um, so the the folks that are under um, 18 are put in appended status until they're registered. Um, I think as council brought up, the question is like, does this legislation allow for appended voters to be public data? Um, so I think that's the question. Okay. I, I just want to speak to yes. uh, their, in, their impended status. Um, so they're not active voters, um, but I but I think that um, it's a valid question as to whether or not those voters would those future voters um, would be considered public data under this bill. So if I'm to understand correctly, no one can do a data request of voters who are about to vote. It's always retrospective, trying to get data on voters who have voted, and only people that are 18 at the time of the November election are people that have voted in previous elections. Is that a correct assessment? So uh, if you wanted to know like who had voted in the last election, yes, that'd be correct. Um, however, uh, folks that are active registered voters are currently public data. So yeah. whether or not you voted in the most recent election, um, you might be still a re an active registered voter. Um, gotcha. So again, the question just would be, does this bill, uh, uh, these under 18 voters are in pended status, so they're not active. So currently, voters in pended status are not public data. So I think that's the, okay. I guess, yeah, I don't it, know if that helps clarify. No, yes, it's Senator Begum. Thank I think you. It, Mr. Chair. Senator Cram. Um, and I, you know, the, the intent in, in Senator Begin is, would be not to provide um, in what, We'll do or change whatever we can to make sure that it protects minors, those, especially if they're in a pended status due to the age and they haven't voted yet, that we certainly would make that modification to pro provide that protection. Senator Brigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, that's a concern. So, I would either, if we don't do that now, I would think a re referral back to s state oh. government would be in order to, to try and do that. Um, Ms. Freeman, before you go too far, sorry. Nope. Um, I'm wondering what what is the penalty if this information would um, be misused um, in a, in a situation like this? Is that um, is that a felony, Ms. Freeman? I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, 
sorry, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head what the penalty is. I know that state law does um, specify what the data can be used for, and it's a around um, election purposes, okay. uh, but I don't know the penalty. We, uh, the, sec the Office of the Secretary of State doesn't um, enforce Okay. Any of that, so. Senator Brigham. And then I'm, I have one more question. Um, so um, somebody could be uh, challenged as somebody that was ineligible to be a voter. Um, and then that information, whether it was true or not, uh, would be public. Am I not right? Am I correct on that, Ms. Freeman? Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator. Um, yes, I think that's our reading of it, is that that is one piece that is currently not, someone, someone's challenge status in the voter registration system is currently not public. Right. Okay. Okay, that's, thank you. Thank you, Senator Brigham. Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, in... Section two of uh, Ms. Ms. I guess it's Mr. Dangle's uh, uh, summary here. It talks about uh, a person requesting public data by state and writing. The data will be, I'm sorry, the sentence before that. After receiving such a request, the Secretary of State and County Auditor must withhold the voter's name from the public. And prior to that, it says that uh, a voter may request that the voter's name be withheld from the public if the voter has safety concerns for himself or the voter's family. Now, I'm understanding, I'm understanding that that is uh, the safe at home uh, designation when a person uh, thinks that there may be a safety issue. And I think there is an application process to, to get uh, safe at home status for a person. Is that correct? And I, I guess uh, Senator Cran or um, Ms. Freeman. Mr. Chair, Senator and Curran. Senator Carlson, yes, and there's no intent in the statute or this proposed bill to change any aspect of the safe at home. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then, Senator Carlson, related to that, uh, where it says that the, the name uh, must be withheld, does that mean the entire record of that person that's safe at home, or would that person be um, designated a, you know, person X? with address and voter uh, history be uh, able to be supplied with that kind of request? Senator Cram. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Carlson, I, I don't believe any of the changes as far as what information is provided. I don't believe this legislation would change the information for those enrolled in the Safe at Home program. Okay. In Ms. Freeman, do you have something to add to that? So there's, a, there's the Safe at Home program and then there's also um, a form where voters can request that they're, sh it's short of the Safe at Home program and separate from it where voters can um, keep their names off of this public information list. Um, I, I believe, I don't have the bill language in front of me, I didn't bring it up, um, but the, I do believe that it doesn't, um, it doesn't, this, this bill doesn't impact that. Mm -hmm. Um, if someone requests for their information to be removed from a public list, they would be removed from the public list. And that's their whole record. And Mr. Mr. Chair. Senator Curran. Yeah, and, and it does protect not only the safe at home, but it's the voter can request the voter's name be withheld in the, in the um, uh, process in which um, Ms. Freeman just described. Yeah. Senator Carlson. Yes, some follow-up. And that, that, when we talk about the voter's name, we're really meaning the voter's record, their total record being withheld. Am I correct in that assumption? Who wants to take that? Senator Cran, Ms. Freeman? That's currently what happens, and because this bill doesn't impact that section, um, that would continue, I believe. Yes. Okay. And Ms. Senator Chair, Carlson. Thank you. Is, is that clear in statute that, that that means record? It doesn't mean just a name? Ms. Freeman. Senator Cran. Sure, Mr. Ms. Chair. Ms. Freeman. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do believe so. Uh, currently, that's the practice when um, essentially if a data practice comes in and that public list is pulled, that person's you know, name and address and entire record doesn't show up on that public list. 
Senator and, Carlson. Yeah, and Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess what I want to make sure is that I'm understanding what the purpose of this is, because we've we've heard uh, discussions of whether the correct number of people is shown on lists of actual voters, accounts of actual voters, and the records of actual voters being, uh, let's say, being available to examine. And I guess what I'm thinking now is that this might, this might have a differential between the counts that are being reported and the records of people voting being, uh, uh, being available for inspection. Am I correct Mr. Chair, Senator Cram. Senator Carlson, I, I believe you're correct, but those, we would have the counts of those people, not the information, but the counts of those enrolled in either the safe at home and or the, um, those that request to have their information kept private or their name. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Cram. Thank you. Senator Johnson. Thank you. I can say this just goes back to Senator Bigham's uh, initial question. <coughs> um, I was just curious about, is there any, any statutory precedent that, that says that, you know, data of, of minors is protected? Uh, and, and would that language supersede anything in this bill, or would this bill, you know, just dictate how that data is uh, treated, you know, for minors? I'm not real familiar with the data statute, so I just had a quick clarification or question on that. Uh, Ms. Primo, do you have any insight on that for us? Mr. Chair, members, there's not a general provision in Chapter 13 that specifically classifies data about minors um, as private data. I believe last session there was a DNR, I don't remember the state agency, a bill specific to minors that passed out of this committee and classified their data as private. Um, but that's the only statute I can think of off the top of my head. And so, Ms. Primo, if the authors indicated and committee members have talked about a wish to make sure that the data uh, for an underage minor is protected. Do you feel that's adequately covered in this bill or would you suggest a, uh, some form of amendment to make sure that's shorn up? Um, Mr. Chair and members, I don't think it's clear to me that that data would, would definitely be private. Um, I think there is potential because this is about making um, the data in this in the registration system presumptively public if the committee or um, a particular member's intent is to make it private then I would probably add that to um, somewhere in paragraph B. Do you have a amendment or can you work on what potential language that might be or do you have something ready for us? Mr. Chair, members, yes. Is the intent to make any identifying information related to a minor private? Senator Ms. Cram. Mr. Chair, yes. And those that have registered yet haven't turned 18, have not voted, and are appended status. Ms. Primo. I, I believe that could be captured. Um, page 1, line 18, after the colon, insert any identifying information related to a minor. Um, minor in, in, st in chapter 645 is defined as anyone under 18. Um, and if, if their data is in the system, I assume they are in that pendant status or they're registered, so I think it captures the intent. All right, could you read that proposal one more time? So page one, line 18, after the colon, insert, any identifying information related to a minor, comma. Senator Coran, what's your feedback Mi to that proposal? Mr. Mr. Chair, um, and if council believes that that accomplishes the stated goal that we have, um, I would agree with that amendment and would like to move forward with it. Senator Limmer. I have a question. Um, on this particular amendment, would that prohibit a candidate from uh, getting a mailing list of those individuals who might be a minor prior to election day? Uh, that, would that prevent uh, 
a, a political brochure being mailed to them in anticipation of them voting on Election Day? Mr. Chair. Senator Cram. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Senator Limmer. Um, I don't know what that answer would be. Um, is that, I don't know if that's available today. Would pendant status? Ms. It's, Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, currently, pendant status voters are not on the public information list. So, Mr. Chairman, Senator um, Limmer. you know, there's drives to get people to register to vote. And oftentimes it's directed at the youngest voters. Uh, we want to encourage them to vote. But don't we also want to encourage them to be an informed voter? So does that mean that those particular voters who might be 17 prior to election day uh, cannot they would not be able to get information from a list that would be provided by the Secretary of State provided. Is that what it is now, the, the law? Ms. Freeman. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Currently, uh, voters that are in pendant status, so those folks under 18, um, wouldn't be on public information lists. So if that was the only um, place that uh, a candidate was getting their data from, um, then yes, they wouldn't be included on there. Ms. Chair, um, um, I suppose, and I, well, not only suppose, I know that there's other ways to get lists of, of uh, young voters that are to be 18 by election day. So that would not prohibit that source from being used by a candidate or a political party then. Is that correct? Might be more of a shotgun approach, but uh, we don't know who would be registered voters and who would not be registered voters, but at least that is not a prohibited activity then. Who wants to take Mr. that? Ch Senator Cran? <laughs> Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Limmer, you know, there's a variety of sources right, to obtain that information. And as you know, it changes and we get continued updates for a variety of sources um, currently today. Our goal was not to, to change that particular piece. I think the, um, the clarity around the statewide voter registration system and those that have voted and the information available is, was really the, where the lack of clarity appears to have um, affected or impacted court cases. And a minor vote or for intent for the purposes of election um, on the front side was not um, a component of this. Okay. Senator Begum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a couple other questions. I would just say that one to Senator Limmer's um, point to that the new language doesn't allow this information that is obtained from the statewide voter registration system will not be used for purposes unrelated to um, elections, political activities, or law enforcement. What if the information was? What is the penalty for that? Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator, Senator Bay, um, I am not familiar with that portion of from the, the enforcement perspective what the penalty would be. Senator Brigham. Yeah, Mr. Chair, it's just no penalty for abiding by, you know, for not abiding by it, I mean. So for, to abuse it, there's no penalty to abuse it. And I think that that's a very bad precedent <laughs> to send. Um, so I don't, I don't know, Mr. Chair. I, um, I mean, I, I just certainly don't think the bill is ready for prime time. I mean, if we want to adopt the proposed amendment, but I think even with that, this bill has a little bit more work to do. I mean, why would we put this in law without any penalty to hold people accountable for abusing the system? So Mr. Chair. I, I just have concerns about that, but Senator I, I know we have a lot of bills. And so I just, for the sake of keeping things moving, I'll just lay my cards on the table, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that, Senator Cram. <laughs> Mr. Chair and, the, and Senator Begum, you, you expressed the very frustration that most have uh, around data privacy and the agency's failure to, the agency's failure to comply with the statute, uh, more or less the compliance and utilization of the data for those that legally are allowed to obtain that data. 
in my opening remarks were the fastest growing uh, request we have on the Legislative Audit Commission or the Legislative Auditor is agencies' failure to provide data. And so, of course, their, their recourse then is to go to the legislative or the office of the, I'm sorry, the administrative law judge is one, which is also very expensive for debt public data requests. And then two, the next one is into the court system to try and get state government to comply with their own statutes. That's what the, the intent of this law is or this bill is to make sure that they do provide clarity to the courts when they have to seek recourse for the continued failure to provide public data which is currently de defined as public data in a wide variety of cases, not just elections, but all, all across the board. This one focuses on the election portion. Mr. Chair. Senator Brigham. But I would argue your bill doesn't fix it because there's, uh, no, there's, no, uh, there's no one being held accountable if there is abuse of the information. And so I, I, um, I hear what you're saying, Senator Coran, um, and, and I do recognize that um, there are a lot of challenges in the um, OLA is, uh, or administ the administrative law judges are, are used for this. I'm not arguing with you on that. All I'm saying is if I use this information for things unrelated to elections or campaigns or law enforcement, there is no penalty against me for doing such. I don't think that's a good precedent to have on our books. So, I mean, you could put a penalty in there and then, you know, we'd have to go to Senator Limmer's committee. Um, but I think this should spend a little bit more time in state gov and, and then let it go through the process. That is just my opinion. Thank you, Senator Brigham. So the uh, oral amendment is read by council has not yet been moved. And if a member wishes to do that, uh, that still needs to be done. Senator Anderson. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, page one, line 18, after the colon, insert any identifying information related to a minor comma. Senator Anderson. Thank you. I'll move the Senator Anderson moves the oral amendment as read by council. Any discussion? Senator Latz. I've been thinking about what Senator Limmer had to say about this. And um, regardless of the other aspects of the bill, I'll just throw this out there for discussion. But if, if a minor decides to pre-register to vote, um, aren't they in some way saying, I'm prepared to have my information available for people who are trying to get information out to potential voters in November, um, aren't they kind of waiving their right to have that data be private when they choose to pre-register to vote? Um, I'm trying to understand the blanket policy behind making the minor data private. I mean, as I understand the bill, and this is not an area I'm spending a lot of time on, but date of birth wouldn't be Date of birth is private information, no matter how you cut it, right? Um, so if there were a request for all registered voters, even those who are appended, um, their name would show up on a list without any identifying date of birth, for example. But they, there would be an address, I presume, so that if no address, if, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe this wouldn't be a good source of data to send out election campaign information anyway or get out the vote efforts. Um, if that's, maybe I should get that clarified first. I saw the Secretary of State's representative shaking her head that maybe there's no address information available. Either. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify, um, Senator, that the um, current voters that are in pendant status, uh, like those who are under 18, are currently not public. Um, it's currently not public data. So they're currently not on the public data lists. Okay. And, and Mr. Chairman, would, Senator Latt, would this bill do anything to change that um, if we didn't clarify yes, with this amendment? amendment? It would make them public. Um, okay, so it, who wants to take that? Mr. Chair. Senator I'm, Cran. I'm not sure we need it. I don't think it would change. Mr. Chair, I, 
I, I don't know that we have that clarity. The intent is to not change current state statute and the operation as, as it relates to minors. And I think if we can provide that clarity, I think the amendment does that. I think we should do that. The goal wasn't to provide um, uh, access to people who haven't voted yet. And in the case of this, in their impended status, I'm just fine with them staying there. And I don't want to accept any other reason that Mr. Latz would want to drive us to um, judiciary. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Senator Lemmer. Read, read the room, Senator Cram. <laughs> <laughs> I did very well, Senator, Senator Limmer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Senator so, Matthews, I don't think we well, did pass the amendment yet, so I'm sorry about that. So, Mr. Chairman, Senator Lass. I mean, I'm not necessarily looking to change the law with regard to minor information here. I think that's a different question that the election committee ought to struggle with, perhaps. I tend to share Senator Limmer's view on this, that uh, perhaps data, the pended data, people who choose to register ahead of time, might be appropriate to be included in a publicly disclosed list if we decide there ought to be a publicly disclosed list. But I think maybe that issue isn't before us here today. And the real issue before us is just to clarify existing law as it might be impacted by this bill. So. I think I'll support the amendment for that reason and, and hope that it, at some point those whose jurisdiction really includes those, some of those election age-related questions will tackle that sometime. I, I have another question unrelated to the amendment, but I'll hold it until after the amendment's dealt with, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, Senator Carlson, to the oral amendment. I'll hold it back. Okay. Any further discussion on the oral amendment as read by council? So, Senator Latz, as I'm, was I hearing you say you're now possibly unsure if the oral amendment is needed? Is that no. The, uh, no, I was questioning the policy behind it. Okay. Um, if, if what we're doing is just clarifying existing law and how this bill would impact existing law, I've got no problem providing that clarity in this bill should it become law. Okay. And I think the amendment provides that clarity. Okay. Any further discussion to the oral amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails and the oral amendment is adopted. Back on the bill before us as amended, Senator Carlson. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I I guess I want a clarifying question here. We've talked about, you know, pre-registering and uh, people before the election. And I think from uh, Senator Coran's first uh, statements here that he's not attempting to change any information that's pre-election. What he needs is something that it clarifies things after the election. If I'm, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I do want to find out if I'm thinking correctly or not. And you mentioned that there was some difficulty in getting some data after the election. I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit more information about just what uh, what has happened that you could not get information after the election, and whether it relates to this uh, posting of election of uh, people who voted into the SRS. Mr. Chair, Senator Graham, Senator Carlson. Uh, yeah, my intent is that it doesn't impact pre-registered, those who haven't voted, but the voted records that have been challenged multiple times, and the courts continually ask us to seek clarity in, in statute and intent of what is public data and what is private data, and that's exactly what this does, to make it very clear, and, and that's what the intent is. So, Senator Carlson. And Mr. Chair, and Senator Crane, can, can you make a little clearer what, what was not available in uh, the private data or other data that you are seeking to uh, to get after the election. Mr. Chair. Senator Coran. There's a variety of data that was contained in multiple lawsuits to validate the election results and were not contained um, or were not provided. And some of those could be ch the status of the, of the voter, challenged voters. Those are very important aspects of when a vote is challenged or a voter is challenged or they don't meet the criteria or they didn't meet the validation post-election and what status are those voters in. 
challenged as one criteria. There are, there are others. And that information should be known from an election cycle to election cycle to make sure that the voter rolls are uh, poor or, or that maintain the integrity um, throughout the entire election process, post-election, and into the next election cycle. Senator Carlson. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senator Cran, you're saying that uh, this bill will uh, divulge who was a challenged voter and the um, the disposition of that challenge? It, it provides, Mr. Mr. Chair, it provides the information that would remain uh, private and then would provide for the ability to have all the other information would be then become public and not arbitrary in nature from the decision of the uh, person who holds the keys to that data vault. Any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, I'm still confused because that last answer just restated the broad outlines of the bill without answering Senator Carlson's question. Is the data that has not been released that this bill seeks to make available for release data that includes the status of a challenged voter, the basis for that challenge, and the results of any challenge? Mr. Senator Chair, I believe, I believe it would, as the challenge status would be extremely important. And all other statuses at a voter can be uh, indicated as such in the statewide voter registration system. So, Senator Lance. Mr. Chairman, that appears to, to be the target of this bill, what I'm trying to ascertain. What problem is, is, is attempted to be solved? Um, and to me, the answer isn't, we've had a lot of questions about the data status of voters coming into the, you know, to our committee. And they, they, okay, so there are a lot of questions. That doesn't really tell you what they are, what the merits are, and how we should respond to it. Um, it's not even clear to me because I haven't read the, the case that's involved particularly here, what the basis was for the court's decision that the data was not public or whether maybe the basis was that under the statute the Secretary of State has the discretion to make that determination and we're not going to interfere with that discretion. Maybe that was it because um, we just had a reference here to don't leave the decision maker in the hands of the person who currently has the key to the vault. So I'm trying to figure out what the problem is that is attempted to be solved. The guardrails that are proposed to be put around this um, is that even if the data is determined to be public and must be released, there are limitations on its use, um, which because this is election-related data, would seem to me to be pretty important to make sure that the data is not misused in some way. Um, and I mean, I'm looking at lines 2.8 to 2.10, and I will tell you, purposes unrelated to elections, political activities, or law enforcement is an exceedingly broad definition of allowable use anyway, because we could sit here and we got a lot of politicians on the panel here. We can tie anything to elections or political activities. So it seems to me that guardrail is of no meaningful value whatsoever. But the other problem here, and Senator Bigham already touched on this, is what are the consequences of not complying with those guardrails, those restrictions? I mean, a uh, um, someone wagging their finger saying you shouldn't have used it for that non-authorized purpose and that's the end of it. Meanwhile, that illegal purpose is out there and already having its negative consequences. Uh, so it seems to me, I guess the first question would be, is there in fact any penalty for violating that use restriction? I think that was raised by Senator Bigham, but I'm not sure I heard a clarifying answer to that. Um, and secondly, if there is not, should there be, and I think there ought to be. And third, what do we do about it if there ought to be a penalty? Um, for me, I think there ought to be a penalty, and if there is not, that's a fatal flaw in this bill. 
But the first question is, is there a penalty? Maybe I hope someone can answer the question. Mr. Chair. Senator Cram. And, and for that particular component of uh, 2.8 to 2.10, uh, uh, um, we would have to verify, and I could verify that was it pulled from any other uh, element or, or existing statute that covers a similar activity. Uh, Ms. Primo, did you have insight on this question? Mr. Chair and members, I'll, I'll direct the committee to um, section 201. Point two seven, which is a current law provision, and specifically subdivision three, which um, provides that an individual who intentionally violates any provision of this chapter is guilty of a felony unless a different penalty is provided by law. And section two of the bill is being placed in chapter 201. So it's possible that could apply. Senator Latz. So, Mr. Chairman, I just pulled up the 201.27, um, and I see that language with regard to intentional uh, violations. Um, I see subdivision three, and I also see uh, Okay, yeah, that would be the generally applicable uh, part. So it would apply only to intentional violations. That's a pretty high standard intentionally, having to prove intent. Um, so I'm not sure I'm comfortable with just an intentional standard. Um, a reckless disregard, for example, would be a lower standard. Might be more appropriate in this case. Uh, Someone negligently fails to maintain the integrity of the data, to secure it in such a way that it's not accessible to those outside of those who have authorized use. Might not be intentional, um, but still just as damaging if, if it's provided. Um, an employee in a bureaucracy hands the data over or access to the data. Um, you know, thinking it's okay, but doesn't take the proper steps. The organization didn't do the proper training to make sure it was clear who could or could not have access to the data, who's held responsible for that. Um, I, I'm not comfortable, even if the keys to the vault are turned and the contents of the vault are handed off to some large, unwieldy, bureaucratic organizations with very clear campaign or election agendas. I don't have a great deal of confidence in this particular penalty provision that it could be meaningfully enforced. Uh, so I guess I'm not satisfied as to the status on that provision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Bigham. Thank you. Just a real quick question, Senator Coran. Um, if there was a, a new challenge, how long does that take? And while that challenge is pending, is that public under your proposal? Um, Senator Mr. Grant. Chair, Senator Bingham, um, I believe the public data request, if one were to occur, and as multiple ones occur over time, um, I do believe that that information is probably got multiple statuses and that should be available. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Bingham. So, even before it's been sorted out, um, whether it's true or not, you know, the challenge, whether, I mean, maybe you were a legitimate voter and somebody just challenged you for whatever the challengeable reasons are, that's public even though it's not resolved or there's like, um, I think we say due process um, here uh, in, in that cause. So if somebody accused you of incorrectly or improperly voting, that's public until it's resolved. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Bigham. Moran. Yeah, and I, I think with all all data requests in the particular databases, um, our election process and the the status of all voters has many different times the statuses change, and so I think that that information is important and critical, and to have the transparency to be able to see all of it is important to the integrity of our elections. 
Any further discussion? Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would like uh, to direct a question to uh, Ms. Freeman. Um, can you tell me, uh, you know, just articulate the, the types of challenges or the flag types that are carried in the voter files? And, uh, you know, and I've, I've heard rumors or references to the number of times that those challenges may be inaccurate and they're set aside. And, you know, is there any statistics on how often these challenges are set aside and then they would be carried in this record that would be disclosed to everyone and it could lead to some harassment of people that perhaps were misidentified and uh, challenged, but then they, it was a challenge because of an error. And uh, being that my name is Jim Carlson, and we had a presidential candidate named Jim Carlson that ran in 2012. I was mis, um, mischaracterized as being that person. Uh, and fortunately, he's in prison right now. But uh, um, I'm, I'm concerned that there could be errors there. And th those would carry into the, into the public knowledge and uh, be used to harass people. And so I guess what I'm asking is, if you can identify the types of challenges and then the number of challenges you think may be inaccurate and also uh, the, uh, um, and maybe even these, uh, these challenges which are done on site at the polls, uh, you know, how many of those are uh, found to be valid and uh, those that are set aside because they were not valid. Mr. Chair, the question is directed towards Ms. Uh, Freeman. Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so there's a lot there, and I don't have all of the information in front of me um, or at the top of my head. Um, so there's a, two different forms of challenges. The, there's challenges that are in the state database um, that are made by a administrator um, or because of data that is shared um, with that county administrator, um, such as a felony record or um, a name change, um, a death, uh, there's other information, I guess that wouldn't be a challenge, but um, there's uh, data that comes in from other databases that uh, are shared with uh, our county administrators. Um, there's also challenges that can be made of someone's voter eligibility at the polling location. Um, those challenges are either resolved at the polling location or, um, or not resolved at the polling location, and so that notation would be something different in the, um, in the database. Um, there are challenges in the database for um, if an ID number can't be verified. Um, there are challenges in a database uh, if an address um, has trouble being verified, um, such as a postal verification card coming back. Um, with, uh, as the OLA mentioned in their report um, several years ago when they looked at our um, state voter registration system, um, there's a number of issues with challenges in that um, there may be a reason why um, someone's postcard came back. It could be something, um, it could be that the address was invalid or it could be that um, a unit number was missing and so it couldn't be delivered to that person's unit. Um, so I think they noted in there that there are oftentimes a lot of um, questions around the challenge. Um, and there might be resolution to it, but it might not have been removed from that voter's record yet. Um, so I think that is the um, a summary of, of challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, any final comments by you, Senator Cran? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the conversation. And I think, uh, again, uh, transparency is the greatest thing we can provide to our citizens to trust all levels of government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Johnson. Floor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move Senate file uh, 3665 be recommended to pass. In as amended. The, as amended and uh, sent to the floor. General orders. Senator Latz. Uh, if the motion is to send it to the floor, I think we need to assess whether there's a fiscal impact on this. And if so, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not appropriate to send it to the floor. I mean, this would require perhaps some changes um, 
in uh, database systems, I don't know, but it's worth asking. And I guess one other question I had, it doesn't look like there's a House counterpart to this bill. So I'm kind of wondering why we're going through this exercise at all. I'm going to let Mr. Turner come up to the table here. Mr. Turner. Mr. Chairman, uh, members and Senator Latz, um, it was my judgment that the bill did not um, require a fiscal note. Um, I don't know, I mean, from your reading, if you can point something out that would counter my judgment, you know, I'd be happy to, to take a, another look at it. Mr. Chairman? Senator Latz. I didn't have a predetermined position on, on that question. I was just asking the question, so I appreciate the input. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right. I still question why we're even doing this if there's no House counterpart. It doesn't seem like there's any chance this bill will become law. We're just going through a public exercise and flailing our arms, but I guess we'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Senator Johnson renews his motion that Senate File 3665 as amended be recommended to pass and be moved to general orders. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 Motion prevails. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Coran. All right, members, uh, next up will be Senator Johnson. I believe will you do Senate file 2352 first? Senator Johnson, welcome to the committee. Senate file 2352. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is not an elections bill, so we may get through it a little bit quicker. Unless you want to tie to it, uh, Senator Latz, but I think we're going to be, we're going to be okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I Senator move Lance. that Senate file uh, 2352 <laughs> be recommended to pass. <laughs> you referred to the Senate floor. <laughs> Can I call the question, too? <laughs> uh, Senator to Johnson. Uh, thank you. To that motion. <laughs> I'll withdraw the motion, Mr. Chairman. And I'll <laughs> withdraw Chairman my question. I'd be happy to go with it. I think it's a wonderful bill, but uh, a very simple bill here that we're looking at today. This simply takes uh, Canadian money judgment orders and allows for a much simpler process here in the state of Minnesota uh, to be uh, filed here in the state of Minnesota without going through a separate lawsuit that many, uh, that the money judgments need to currently go through. It's a process that has been uh, put together by the Uniform, Bar Com uh, Uniform Laws Commission and has been adopted by a number of other states uh, across the country. Uh, we have the foremost expert in this area today uh, here at the table with me today uh, to give just a little bit of, <laughs> just a little bit of background information on that. Uh, for your for your information, Senator Johnson, do you also have an author's amendment? I I do. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It moves the effective date uh, to 2023. Uh, Senator Johnson, I have an A1 amendment, which just deletes Section 12 altogether. Is that your intent? Is that yes. 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 All right, Senator Johnson moves the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Amendment is adopted. Welcome to the committee. If you would please identify yourself for the record and then feel free to begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Bob Tennyson. I'm a Uniform Law Commissioner. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Uniform Law Conference to uh, present this bill. Uh, <clears throat> the um, Uniform Law Conference and the Uniform Law Conference of Canada 
uh, we're jointly adopted this, uh, developed this legislation. Uh, there's a lot of tra um, business between Minnesota and Canada, and it's a very important um, piece of uh, legislation. Um, it it, it uh, basically is an amendment to the uh, Foreign Country Money Judgments Act, which was passed by this state uh, legislature years ago. Uh, basically, what it does is right now, if you want to, if you have a judgment in Canada and you want to enforce it against property in the United States. You, you have to, in Minnesota, you have to uh, take the judgment from Canada, uh, include it in a new lawsuit here in Minnesota, file the lawsuit, take up time in the court and all that. And um, this allows you to register the judgment without going through a court process. It saves uh, money for the litigants. It saves the state money because you don't have to tie up the courts. And, and it's a simplified the process. It, it, the... Um, Rights of the defendants are protected in every respect. The same rights exist uh, under the registration as under the uh, current law method for enforcing a judgment. And uh, we, over the years, have recognized the Canadian judgments and, and, uh, and have not had any problem with that. And it, so we I encourage you to adopt the act. I'd be answer, happy to answer any questions if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Tennyson. Uh, Senator Johnson, did you have something? <clears throat> to add? No, okay. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak for or against this bill? Seeing none, any questions from committee members? Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm warning to the uh, testifier if he intends to have this named after himself. We already have the tennis. <laughs> we already have the Tennyson Amendment. Is this going to be the Tennyson Law? I wonder if we can name this after you too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tennyson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion from members? All right, hearing none, uh, Senator Johnson, do you want to move your bill? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move that Senate file 2352 be recommended to pass and move to general orders. As amended. As amended. On that motion, all in favor say aye. I oppose say no. Motion prevails and the bill is passed. Senator Johnson, I believe you have a second bill. Senate file 3853, and I believe you have an A1 author's amendment for this as well. Yes, Mr. Chair. We can do that author's amendment um, right away to BE. Senator Johnson moves the A1 author's amendment to Senate file 3853. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This again is uh, a clarifying language, but it, it also allows for a minor who's been emancipated to assert their right uh, in a uh, restraining order situation. So currently, uh, a, an individual must have a part, uh, parent, guardian, conservator, step-parent of the minor to actually move uh, that order forward. This would allow an emancipated, uh, someone who's considered legally on their own uh, to seek that order, restraining order. So uh, very straightforward uh, bill here. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if you have any questions, happy to take them now. All right. Uh, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Johnson, for bringing this forward. And I know there's a testifier on there, but I just want to say that I think it's an important process because with emancipated minors, they have to be able to do this. Um, they're, you know, legally recognized uh, as, you know, their their own you know, they, they're an adult pretty much, you know, they have their responsibilities and this allows them to do that to protect themselves. Um, then it could quite possibly be uh, for the reason they were em emancipated. Right. So um, I just think this is great uh, clarifying language and um, currently uh, you have to have a parent uh, sign with you if you're a minor and getting a, a restraining order and this just allows them to do that on their own. So. Uh, appreciate you bringing this forward and looking forward to hearing from the testifier. 
I believe we have Mr. Elwood on the Zoom call. If you'd come up, there you are. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Elwood. Please identify yourself for the record and then begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. I really don't need to say very much. Uh, Senator Johnson did a great job. I will just say that um, Legal Aid does uh, have a youth law project and does represent kids in this situation. And while there will not be that many of these, the important thing is for those uh, who need it, it is extremely impactful and important. And I think I would just uh, echo Senator Bigham's uh, comments as well. So thank you all very much for hearing this bill today and I urge your support. Any further discussion? Anyone else wishing to testify to this bill? Seeing no further discussion, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that Senate File 3853, as amended, be recommended to pass and move to general orders. Thank you, Senator Johnson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails and the bill is passed. Uh, members, the uh, hearing ran long, so the last two bills I'd already uh, rearranged with the authors for coming back this evening on. Uh, so we are going to go into recess till 5.30. I believe it will be back to this room, but we need to uh, clarify that, uh, get authorization from the sergeant's office about the room arrangement. So I believe it will be back in room 15 at 5.30. Uh, watch your emails. We'll update you if... Uh, if the room will be a different one from that. Uh, so with that, members, this committee stands in recess.